Yes, the clock has hit seven here in South Africa. Um, we've actually had quite a few more people attendees register, um, but they may be running slightly late. But I'm going to not waste any more time and I'm going to delve straight into sharing the screen with all of you and then we can get to chatting about what we are here to speak about this evening. And please do feel free throughout the webinar to leave me any questions you may have um, in the Q&A tab and I will answer them as and when I can, but please do drop me a question there if you do have any. So this evening we are going to be speaking about understanding the Lightroom crop tool. But before we delve into Lightroom, I want to take a moment just to share a few slides with you, just so that you can get an understanding as to what you should be using the crop tool for. So let's delve straight into it. Now looking at this baboon image uh, climbing out of a tree in uh, this was Samburu in Kenya, northern Kenya, and a beautiful and simple image, but I'm sure that a lot of you would agree with me that there are some distractions in it. So if you wouldn't mind in the chats, just leave me what you think is a negative, um, or what has a negative impact in this image. Um, just looking at it at a quick glance, what is taking your eye away from the baboon itself? I hope that you can all see this. There we go. Okay, I'm getting some responses there. So trees on the side, that's definitely it. So well done, you guys are all spot on there. It's definitely the tree on the right hand side and a bit of that um, trees, branches hanging off in the left hand corner. So if you look at that now, this is obviously a lot more to the point. There aren't any distracting elements drawing your eye away to those edge contrasts. So looking at the two images side to side, you can see the major impact of what only a slight crop on this image was, is just eliminating those uh, contrasting distractions on the edges of your frame. It's also very important when you're out in the field photographing to try and eliminate that edge contrast as much as you possibly can. Um, but it's definitely those sidebar, uh, those side distractions that do um, tend to be a bit of a nuisance and it's good when out in the field that you try and eliminate that as much as possible as well and um, the reason being is that we'll get to why you want to eliminate the amount of cropping that you do to your image in just a little bit at least now you've got a sneak peek as to what we will be speaking of next and as you would see it is obviously the rule of thirds. So the rule of thirds is very imp important for uh, your composition and placing your subjects in the correct area within the frame to make for a more appealing and better looking photograph. So now looking at this image um, on the left, you will see that that lion is just to the right of that bottom left green cross. So these little green crosses are what we refer to as PowerPoint. And the closer you can get your subject to one of these PowerPoints, the better. So obviously here I have used the bottom PowerPoint in the bottom left because my animal is um, sitting on the left hand side of the frame, staring into the right hand side of the frame. So I've left negative space for that animal to gaze into. So with cropping in slightly, this would also help you in terms of perfecting your composition if you did not do so in camera out in the field. And so you can get your leading lines and your rule of thirds um, in the right place and therefore make for a more appealing 
looking photograph. Another reason why we would want to crop, and yeah, you can see the images side to side already. Unfortunately, it was supposed to be a surprise, this big reveal. But looking at the image on the left over there, you will notice that it seems like this ocean is running at a slant, at an angle, which is quite strange. Um, it's a great image. It looks good. It's exposed well, processed well. But people are going to sit and look at that image and be like, what's going on there? Why is this horizon not straight? Whereas if you can crop it out and use your leveling tool within the cropping function, you can level out an horizon pretty quickly. And it's quite a simple and easy task. And it's one that is really needed. If that horizon is slightly off, it's, it will take your viewers um, a moment or two to kind of adjust to it. And in turn, it might leave a bit of a sour taste in their mouth when they are looking at that photograph. So very important to try and keep those horizons straight at all times. Now looking at this next image of the wildebeest up here, you will clearly see that the image on the left and the energy of this image is moving from the right to the left. So there's motion across this lake in the Amboseli. And the orientation therefore is correct because my movement's coming from the left to the right. And now before I enlarge the image on the right over here, you will see that I've used a very different um, orientation in terms of the size of that crop. So the image on the right over there is a 16 by 9 crop. And there are what is possible within Lightroom and in the cropping tool, which I will show you, to choose different orientations for specific reasons. So if you have a scene that's highly, or there's a lot of motion moving from the right to the left or left to the right, whatever it may be, you can use, for example, a 16 by 9 crop, which cuts a little bit away from the top half of the frame and the bottom half of the frame kind of squishes it down. And because of that, you um, kind of portraying a wider and larger open space, which is great for scenes that have quite a bit of motion and movement in them. Now, another very important reason why we would want to use the cropping tool is if you look at these images that are displaying at the moment. In the spur of the moment, you sometimes don't always think straight when you're out in the field. And it happens to me on a regular basis where I get so excited when something's in front of me and something's about to happen that I usually just pick up and shoot because that, in this case, that bird was standing beautifully, beautiful, clean, um, silky smooth background that was created because of the vegetation that was behind it. And I didn't really think fast enough to flick to portrait orientation and take a better photo or it would have been a better photograph because I wouldn't have had to crop out those kind of wasted spaces on the edges of that frame. So this is also where your tool or the cropping tool will come in great use where you can crop it um, in a portrait orientation because clearly in this image the energy of the image is moving from the top the bird's head down its neck into its body through its legs where it's then grounded and there this is the flow of the image from top to the bottom so therefore it will display better in portrait orientation so that is what i wanted to quickly run through uh, when it comes to the slides that i presented and i see there's another um question in the chats what is the shortcut uh, for the different grids when you are cropping? Linda, I will get to that as soon as I get into Lightroom at the moment. And please, if you do have questions, the chats can fill up quite a bit, the chatting um, panel. So if you have questions, please do leave it in the Q&A so that it's there and in my face and I will not lose it. But let's get into Lightroom itself where I have prepared a few images for us to chat about this evening, when to crop, what the shortcuts are, and um, all the different things that come along with um, the cropping tool in Lightroom. So I just need to move 
my face out the way there. So this is us in Lightroom in the develop module where all the magic happens, where all the editing and processing happens. And Martha, I saw you are online. I'm sure you'll remember this moment very well. A trail in the Makuleki it was a incredible experience and great time spent on foot in the middle of Africa. It really was great. So looking at the cropping tool in Lightroom and the reason why you want to crop first before you do anything else to your photograph is because it will make a major change to the histogram. And this is obviously a very important crop first so that that histogram changes. And then when you start processing through basic tone curve colors and whatever it may be, you've got, um, a, if I may call it a stable histogram to work with, because if you do an entire edit first and then go and crop, you may end up with a result that you might not be too pleased with. So it's good to crop first and then um, make your adjustments to the image. So you'll see that this uh, toolbox up here, if I hover over this, will tell you that this is the crop overlay. So you can either click on that to activate the crop, or as you will see in brackets there, the shortcut to this tool is the letter R. So all I will do is tap my letter R and you will see by default in Lightroom, the rule of thirds overlay and all grid pops up. And Linda, I will get to discussing how you change these overlays in just a little bit. Before I get there, I want to just explain to you all how you can go about getting an image that you had photographed in landscape orientation and how in Lightroom you can flip it into portrait orientation. Now there are two ways. There's a long way and a short way. So the long way is with the um, orientation lock activated, keep that locked. You can then on either one of the corners, you will see those angle corners, your cursor changes when you hover over that. Left click and hold and pull directly to the left and it jumps into portrait orientation. But there's a shortcut to this and it is while you're in the cropping tool, just tap the letter X. And once you tap that letter X, it jumps straight into your portrait orientation. If you want to head back to landscape, you just simply tap X again for the second time and you can then flick between um, portrait and landscape. So a nice, easy and um, quick tool to use to cycle between the orientations that you would like to make use of. Then you just simply hit enter. If your crop is, if you're happy with this crop, you can either just hit enter click on that little crop tool box or just go and click on the word done down on the bottom right and that'll activate the crop that you have now selected and obviously this image would work better in portrait orientation because the energy and the flow of this image is moving from what's in the foreground which is martha through to our guide and into the sunset in front of us and so therefore as a portrait orientated image, this will be more appealing because there's more direction and more flow within this image. If we had kept this at um, portrait or landscape orientation, let me just pull this through. I'm sure a lot of you would agree with me in saying that a lot of the space on the left, yeah, it may add some value, but this will result, this area up here will result in your viewer's eyes getting lost in the scene. So it'll come through from Martha to the guide and sun, and then your eyes are gonna start bouncing around in the scene, which ideally you do not want. So therefore, just hit letter R to activate crop, tap the letter X, it takes you into portrait orientation, tap enter, and this would be the crop I would choose for this image. Now moving on to, our second image, 
And Linda, this is where I will get to the crop overlays for you. And at a first glance, when you activate the cropping tool, so as I've opened it, because I tapped the letter R, my crop overlay tool has opened up. And at a first glance, it doesn't seem like that much. There's not much going on. Um, but there are a few shortcuts and hidden tricks and tips that will make this cropping tool a bit more sized up, but it's obviously not visual within or visible within the tools that are available on hand over here. So coming to this image over here, and as I'd mentioned by default, Lightroom provides you with a default of the rule of thirds where each section of the image is divided into equal thirds. So the right, the middle, or the right, the middle, the left, and then the very bottom, the center, and the top half of the frame. So it's divided up equally. And there were those lines intersect. Remember with that line image I'd shown you, those cross points are what we refer to as those power points. So as it stands here, we have a powerful crop or oh, um, powerful composition on this image. And now remember what I had mentioned is that one of the reasons why you want to use your cropping tool is to rid, eliminate or eliminate distracting edge contrast. So this vehicle being one and our vehicle's mirror in this bottom left corner being another. So there are multiple ways in which you can crop your image. And I will show you all of them this evening. But remember, when I am now busy cropping, please keep your eye on that histogram. So before I go and crop correctly, let's keep our eye on this histogram. Because remember, it changes when you go and make that crop. Did you notice that histogram spike or drop in spike? When I eliminated a lot of that bright sky, the shadow started, or the darker area started peaking a bit more in the histogram. And the highlighted areas, those spikes drop down quite a bit. If I take it back up to its full size, you will see how those highlighted areas are spiking quite dramatically. And this image that we're looking at, because I shot with a full frame Canon camera, by default, because it obviously depends on the sensor of your camera, but by default on a full frame camera, you will have an orientation of about two to three or four to six, as some refer to it as. And usually when I crop, I like to keep this little padlock activated. I like to keep it locked. The reason being is because now if I go grab one of these corner tools and I drag my cropping tool inward and outward, it keeps that same orientation for me. Whereas if you deactivate that little lock, you will notice that I can change that orientation and it can throw your composition and just the look and feel of that image off slightly. So I'm always a fan of keeping the pad locked activated so that I can keep that same ratio and that it does not get disturbed. So as I mentioned, there's multiple ways in which you can crop your image. So you can either grab the top corners, drag inwards and outwards. You can also grab those side angle tools, pull that inward and outward. And then thirdly, you have an aspect tool, which you can go and select. And you can literally draw a block over the area you would like to crop and it will then activate it there for you. I've never ever used that aspect tool. I just go straight in for um, these angle tools. I find it being the quickest and somewhat the most accurate. So right here, what we wanna do is go and eliminate these distracting elements. So the best way we can go about doing that is just pulling it in slightly where we just lose visual of those vehicles. And then maybe what we want to do is just eliminate that elephant's bum and tail over there to something like that. 
maybe pull this top right corner in slightly so that now we have two of these um, PowerPoints touching our subject. And if I now simply hit enter, that will be the crop eliminating those vehicles on the left. And it goes straight to that point. There's not many distractions and boom, we've got an elephant here wanting to cross the road. But now Linda had asked a very important question and it's something that I only learned years down the line when it came to <laughs> when it came to my workflow in Lightroom is that I didn't even know that you could change the orientation of your grid overlay within the cropping tool. So it's quite a, a simple um, thing. All you need to do is while you are in your cropping tool is tap the letter O for overlay. So if I go and click the letter O, you will see how it's now moved from the rule of thirds to like this triangular diamond shaped grid. If I keep tapping the letter O, you will see now I've just divides it into quarters for me. If I keep going through, you then get these angled tools. And this is also just everything um, rule of third or uh, these overlays do is to either get your rule of thirds right or to show you while looking at this image how or where this image is flowing and where your viewer's eyes will travel when looking through the scene. So basically here, your viewer's eyes are probably going to start in the bottom right hand side of this frame and make it their way across over that elephant's face up into the sky and then eventually those dark elephants in the distance over there are going to pick your viewer's eyes up and your eyes are going to drop down. So basically your viewer's eyes are going to run through the image like this and then dip down to the elephant on the horizon here. So using this overlay for this image as well will give you a great idea as to how your viewer's eyes will travel across the scene. But now there are a few overlays within Lightroom that you can actually flip around and this is one of them. So remember just by simply tapping the O letter O, it'll flick between overlays. But if you want to see if a tool can flip and go the opposite way around, just push and hold your shift key and then tap the letter O and you will see how that overlay, the specific one, is flipping and moving around. But we can keep going through. So yeah, we have the golden um, grid. And this obviously is now not, it looks very similar to the rule of thirds, but it's pretty much set up 40 on each side with 20 in the middle. So 40%, 20%, 40%. Um, and it's something that I don't really use too often. We have the golden spiral or the golden mean which you will see that the mean obviously ends up here or the, the spiral itself. This is another tool that you can now use um, the shift key for. So pushing and holding shift and flicking between that overlay, your grid will obviously, or your, your spiral will obviously go and end up in different areas within the frame. And in all honesty, this is also a great representation as to how your viewer's eyes will flow and move throughout the scene. So looking at this, your viewer's eyes are obviously going to start on the, the animal, the, the main animal up ahead in front of us here, which is very close to where the spiral kind of burns out. But then your viewer's eyes will travel around and through the scene to those elephants up on the horizon over there. But if you continue just tapping O, you will get to your ratios as to your two by three, your five by seven crop, your four by five crop. And you can then see if you want to export or crop at these sizes where you will have to position your crop in order to get your animal or your subject within the right place within the frame. But it's also very a, a good tool to use if you are thinking of cropping an image or uh, printing an image and you crop it in a certain way, but you would like to print it at a two by three portrait, then you will know, okay, only that portion that's within the two by three portraits 
grid over here will be um, present and will be visible on the actual print because a lot of the time people go into print and they crop it a say for example a four by five so they have a much broader image but they're printing it at two by three which is a narrower portrait and therefore they get upset and say well i don't see the back leg of my elephant it's because you've cropped it at four by five but printed it at two by three so this might be a good tool for you to make use of but this is something i don't really use either you then have this grid which is not really for your um, composition and where to place your animal within the frame this is more for horizons that might be skew and in this case it does seem like the horizon is slightly off but i've got another image that we will look at how to straighten up an horizon within the crop tool uh, but this grid is in place to help us straighten up and level out the horizon but in my opinion this is one of the methods that take up a bit more time it may not be as accurate because you have to physically sit there and now try and figure out if one of these lines are running perfectly in line with the horizon and then simply tap o again and it takes you straight back to your normal rule of thirds overlay and as i've mentioned i don't my computer is not set up like this at all i've got I think I've got three overlays that run, and it is the rule of thirds, it is the golden mean, and then the, the um, that triangular one. So if you want to go and change a few things up, I will show you how. So if you just go up into tools and you come down to crop guide overlay, and then come all the way down to choose overlays to cycle, you can then go and deactivate whatever you do not want to go and make use of. So I'm going to go confuse Johanna a little bit now. And I'm going to get rid of the aspect ratio, the golden ratio, uh, the thirds I'm keeping, triangle, center. And now if I say OK and tap the letter O, you will see it only flicks between the four that I have kept activated within that overlays to cycle. Um, and this will just speed up your process. Instead of hitting O 10 times, you hit it two or three times and you're back to the default of your rule of thirds. Um, so Linda, I hope that answers your question. Quite a simple one. Just tap the letter O and this will run through the various overlays that you have available. Now moving on to this image over here. So we can now see, and this is where we're going to speak about the horizon and how a skewed horizon, as I've mentioned, can put your viewers' eyes um, and mind off a little bit. It'll leave a slightly sour taste. So it is very important to try and crop your image and then at the same time straighten horizons that are not straight. So you will see that there's a little word oh, before I get into the um, the horizon portion, I'd forgotten to show you how and where to change the orientation of the scene. So say, for example, we wanted to crop this a 16 by 9 and not keep it at the standard uh, 2 by 3. All you would need to do is just go and tap on and left click on the word original. And you will see running down here, you've got various options that you can now go and make use of. So one by one, which is just a square, which works very well on, um, on Instagram. You can then go four by five. And a four by five portrait, if you do have a portrait shot that you really want to use in, on Instagram, cropping it to a four by five portrait fits perfectly in Instagram. Remember your X letter X will flick between your orientation, so portrait to landscape. And this is basically how we will go about changing different aspect ratios in terms of the image crop. Okay, so for, for the purpose of this image, I'm just gonna keep it at my default. Let me just go, if you wanna get back to the original, you just tap 
on original or if you've done some funky stuff and you don't want to go fight because often when you go and um, straighten horizons or move it slightly like that for example trying to get it back to its original state it needs to be perfectly level as shot to get it back to what it originally was so if you're struggling with that just simply tap this reset key over there and it takes it back to where it should be now the horizon is skewed here there are various different ways in which we can now go and straighten the horizon there is the quickest way which i will show you last but let me start off with the ones that may take slightly longer now looking at your cursor hovering over your image while in the crop orientation tool it will be this little aspect tool at hand by default but as soon as you go and hover over those corners you can obviously drag and pull those to crop the image but if you just drop down from that slightly and hover next to the side of that image you will see the cursor becomes an up down skewed arrow which then if you left click and hold that grid automatically changes into this horizon level grid for us and you can then go and physically move by just clicking and holding and dragging up and down you can then go and move this to try and get this horizon level something like that but yet again to me this is not the most accurate way so we can just go tap reset another way in which we can straighten up the horizon is you'll see there's a little word auto over here usually lightroom is very intelligent and quite smart and it will pick up on this quite well and by tapping auto there boom the horizon seems pretty straight and i would be happy with this but it doesn't always work too well so i rely on the angle tool but before i show you how to get that a third way in which we can straighten horizons is just to the right of the word angle we have a little button which can slide to the left or to the right which you can then again use to twist the scene to get that horizon as straight as you possibly can but over the years i have found that the tool that i'm about to show you and this is the fourth and final way in which you can straighten your horizons this is to me the most reliable and most accurate way and this is the angle tool over here now you can either go and actively select that angle tool by hovering over it and left clicking on your mouse you will then be given your angle tool but if you want the shortcut to this if you just while hovering over the scene click um, and push and hold the command key on your keyboard and you will see how it's flicking between your aspect tool and your angle tool so now while you depressing your command key you left click on a point on the horizon let's go back into that left click on the point on the horizon and while you're still depressing the left hand button on your mouse you drag your mouse across that horizon, drawing a perfectly straight line, then letting go of command and your left key. And to me, that horizon is now perfectly straight. And we can then say done. If you don't want to crop anymore, you've got a straight horizon and people are going to go and double tap that on Instagram for you because you've got straight horizons. So quite impressive just to think that what doesn't look like much off the bat looking at this tool is actually quite a lot when you start digging into um, what you can actually do with the, the cropping tool in, in Lightroom. But now before we move on, before I tell you a few of the downsides as to where and why you shouldn't crop too much is this constraint to image, little box that you can either select or keep blank for the most part i never really select this but what this does is after you've done your crop and after you've worked through your entire process and editing the image through basic tone curve and all of these wonderful things you can do to your photograph 
under lens corrections, what this will do is it'll help you get rid of distortions around the surrounding areas with certain camera lens setups. You may sometimes find that it's distorted on those edges and lens correction will um, kind of fix that for you. Uh, it's very intelligent software and so therefore it will make it look good, fresh and normal again and as it was seen out in the field. And what this constraint to image does is at times, and it's very seldom that it happens, but when you do use lens correction, it could destroy some of your pixels along your crop. And you may be left with one or two blank pixels. And what constraint to, to image would do is it will eliminate that for you and it'll fix it up so that you're not left with any um, blank pixels. But I would say 99 out of, out of 100 times that you would activate this and use it, nothing would really happen. It's very seldom that you get left with, with blank pixels. So it's something that I don't really activate and use in a crop. I just usually skip that, that step and I just keep moving on. Okay, so we're very close to the end now. And the last thing I want to chat about is just watch how much you crop. And you don't want to be too heavy handed on a crop because a lot of the times I see people take a shot like this and they say, but oh, I really wanted a portrait of this lion looking at me like this because obviously that tooth's quite a, um, a stand out feature on this cat. He was a very well known lion in the Sabi sand. But look at what happens here. Quality wise, this image looks good. So there's two downsides to cropping an image is firstly, you lose image quality when you crop. So let's go into this and say, oh, Mike, I really, really, really wanted to get a portrait of this cat. So I've now hit the letter R to get into my crop tool, tap the letter X to change the orientation to portrait, and then start dragging this tool downwards so that I can now get a nice close portrait of this cat. Now it doesn't look too bad and maybe for Instagram it would work, but this image quality compared to, because I was fortunate enough to spend a lot of time with this cat in my guiding here at Sabi Sabi, I had many a moments where I got really close, sometimes too close to this cat, <laughs> but too close for comfort. But if you never, if you don't think your images are good enough, I think it was Ansel Adams that said this, get closer. So now looking at this next photograph, if you want to compare image quality on this in terms of the sharpness and how good the details still look on this image compared to what it looks like in this one now, if I go into a 200% to zoom in a little bit, things are getting slightly distorted and it's not looking too good. It's slightly pixelated. And the reason for this is it's just because I've cropped way too much. I've taken it from a massive full size landscape image to this tight 800 millimeter type crop into this lion's face. So that's one downside to it is that you lose image quality. So if I had to bring both of these up real quick, just highlight both of them, hit the letter C to compare, you will see there's much more detail on the image on the right and the only reason for this is because I was 20 to 30 meters closer to that cat when I photographed him in the uh, image you see on the right hand side over here. So get closer if you want a portrait image, but obviously just don't get out the car and walk to the line, make sure it's safe to do so. Uh, but most of the times, if you plan your position strategically, that animal might come straight towards you and it'll then lend you that opportunity. But if there are any of you online this evening that are into printing your images and want to print your images in the future, I'm just gonna give you a quick tip as to how you can kind of roughly work out how large you can print your images. Now in Lightroom, if I hit the letter I while I'm reviewing an image, two bits of information will come up. Firstly, if I tap I, you will see my file name, the date and time this image was captured, and then um, a number below that 
which is 5,472 by 3,648. If I tap I again, I'll get a second set of information. I've still got the file name, and then it gives me my settings I was on and the gear I, or the lens I was using over here. But, and then tapping I for the third time, we'll get rid of that information. But what we wanna work with here is this first set of information. And it's that value down at the bottom. So the 5,740, uh, 5,472 by 3,648. So basically doing some simple math here, and we've got a quick calculator. If I take this value of 5472 times uh, 3648, this gives me 19,961,856, a very large number. And I'm surprised my tongue didn't twist doing that. And this is basically all the pixels that you would now find in this image. So almost 20 million pixels, individual pixels that have created this image for me. So you would obviously have heard if you, even if you're a beginner photographer, you would have heard the term um, megapixels. And this is where it comes from. It's that value over there. That 5,472 by 3,648. So 5472 are the amount of pixels you will find from the very far left hand corner all the way across the scene to the very right. Whereas the 3,648 are the pixels you'll find on the top left running all the way down to the bottom left. That's the amount of pixels within the scene. So multiplying those, you will then get 19,961,000. So this is basically a 19.9, .9, or if you really want to round it off, an image, a 20 megapixel image. So now that's how you can now work out the size of the photograph itself and how many pixels they are. But when it comes to printing an image, and I'm just gonna use an industry standard size here because this is something that many different printers or photographers um, or individuals will have a different opinion on, but kind of the industry standard printing resolution is what we refer to as 300 DPI. So what DPI stands for is dots per inch. So pixels basically per inch when you're looking at printing or exporting a photograph for print. And what this basically means is per inch on that image. So if we had to divide this image up into what would be inches, you need to have at least 300 little dots, individual dots of information within an inch of your print. So if we take the, this, the same value we see up here now, this 5472, which is the amount of pixels running across the frame. So let me take 5472, divide that by the, the industry standard, which is 300 dots per inch. So I'm dividing that by 300 equals and that is 18.24. So 18.24 inches would be how this image would print well across the top of the frame. So you can have it width-wise 18 inches long. And then taking it from top to bottom, we'll take 3648 divided by 300. And that gives you 12 inches. So this image would print really well at 18 by 12 inches. Now there is upsizing software like Photoshop has a, a really good upsize tool where you can um, upsize the image to print it a bit larger than, it, than you actually could in terms of the, the pixels. But this is just a really standard um, industry kind of favored way of working out as to how large you can print this image. Now, another downside of cropping this image is now look at this. If I remember what this was, so you can almost say five and a half thousand by three and a half thousand, right? If I go into my crop tool and I want a portrait of this lion and I go and crop it there, look at what's happened to those numbers. So now across the top of the frame, I've only got 769 pixels by 1,154, 
which is nothing. So in terms of the print size, that drops a lot. And because that's dropping a lot, if you want to go print this massive portrait, as you see it here for a big wall, image quality is going to be revolting. Whereas if you look at an image shot closer up of that same line, but just because I was close and I didn't have to crop at all for this image, I can go and print this much larger than I can print this image over here. So those are the two downsides of cropping an image in Lightroom and cropping too much. Because cropping it to that extent, I would never, ever, ever recommend. It's, it's not good. So try and stay away from that as much as you possibly can. Now, I see there were two chats that had come in. Um, I just want to make sure that these were not uh, questions. There we go. There we go. So Tim has a comment. I understand the desire in some cases obsessed to have straight level horizons, especially for seascapes, ocean areas, the Amseli. Um, but in nature, not all horizons are straight, uh, generally sloping hills in the background. Uh, in just the same way that not tree trunks are particular, sometimes we need to look at other ways of ensuring the orientation is correct. That's a great note there, Tim. Um, and it's true what you say in areas like the, the Masai Mara, for example, is an absolute nightmare to shoot in at times because there's so many different slopes out over the fields and the plains of the Masai Mara. So it can get quite challenging keeping them as level as possible. Um, but yes, it is more, you can be a lot more um, wound up when it comes to things like that in areas that are a lot more forgiving where there aren't these slopes and hills. But yeah, the Masai Mara, it is very, very tough to keep things um, quite leveled out. But thank you for pointing that out. I really do appreciate it. And I don't see any questions that have popped in this evening. I don't know if there's anyone who wants to leave a late question. But usually by now, there would have been a few questions populated. If you can't think of a question now, that's okay. If you've got questions in the future, just please send me an email and I can then respond to that. I will answer your questions happily. And um, I thank you yet again for joining me this evening. I really did enjoy it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new. And I do hope that I get to see you all in my up and coming webinar, which is next week, the 4th of November, where I'm gonna be taking this a little step further where I will be speaking about the Instagram process or selection and, and process um, of, of my images and how I approach processing my work in order to put it out on platforms such as Instagram and or Facebook. So if you have not registered for that yet, please do. And if you cannot make that time or the date, register anyway and I will send you the high definition video so that you can make use of it whenever you can and at your own leisure. But thank you all again for this evening. Thank you for everyone's kind words in the chats. And yeah, until next time, have a great week further. There's not much of it left, but have a great weekend. And I will chat to all of you soon. Bye-bye.